-hmm. Okay, we're live. We've been live, but whatever. You know what I mean. We're live for another edition of the MMA Prospectus. I am joined by my wonderful co-host, as always, Tom Grant. And we have an exciting week this week because the UFC is back. And not only is the UFC back, but it's back with a card that nobody cares about but us because it is packed to the gills with young talent that nobody has ever heard of. It was a ton of, like, a ton of European talent that had no, like, I, a bunch of guys had to go watch tape on, like, immediately. Cause like, oh, nope, never heard of this guy, never heard of that guy. It was exciting when I actually, like, when you got, like, a Dolby or, like, a Derek Lewis or, like, you know, um, Alessio, who was like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely, you know, I'm not going to say that everybody on this card, all the young fighters on this card are obviously, like, elite future contender prospects, but I'm really happy to talk about a card like this just because it is filled with young fighters that I think a lot of people have interest in, you know? The, the, it's filled with young fighters that people are like, well, how's this guy going to do, you know? People are excited about Philip Page. They're excited about Demir Hadzovic. Um, You know, they're excited about Ian Entwistle, maybe, and... Uh, obviously, Curtis Blades yes. and Francis Ngannou and Bojan Velskovic and Alessio De Chichiro. There, there are some guys on here, or Chirico. There are some guys on here that, even if they don't contend, they're new blood. They're fresh out of the gate. This is their first UFC event for a lot of them, and I can't wait to talk about them. Well, it's one of those things that we talked about it that, you know, there was another end. We were in a run where it was just a bunch of cards with. Veteran, longtime veterans, longtime UFC yep. fighters, or guys off the regional scene, but maybe not necessarily um, prospects. And yeah. this is the other end of that, where it's basically all prospects, a bunch of heavyweight prospects, too. Yeah, the UFC is finally, I think, I, I, I want to bet that at some point they've, tr maybe, th this is just a guess, is that at some point they've tried to put together a heavyweight, another heavyweight season of tough. And figured out that it just didn't make any sense. And so instead, they just went out and signed all the guys they would have wanted to get. Because over the past year, they've signed like 25 to 30% of their heavyweight division in the last year. I mean, they got to be looking for, and we've talked about this, they, they have to be looking for new blood in that division. Yep. Because... Oof. <laughs> I think you you were on press row talking with Jordan Breed about it, how little the heavyweight division's changed in the last 10 years. Yeah, it's just, I mean, for the pa before this year, over the past half decade, 2010 to 2015, really all they did was go out and find the longtime seasoned vets. Like, they, they went out and got all the pride guys that they didn't get when they bought Strike Force. That, yeah. was, well, that was what they did over the last half decade, including buying Strike Force, in fact, because that happened over that half decade. So it, it, kind it of really feels, wasn't a, a time in MMA where they were picking up much in the way of young heavyweight prospects at all. I mean, Kane Velasquez, Junior Dos Santos, all, those kind of guys that um, made up the you know the the young fighters coming on. Um, that we saw evolve over that time. They they all signed before then. Yeah, I was going to say, it is one of those things that it feels like for the last, you said, 10 years, UFC's really leaned heavily on already developed heavyweights. That even after they, you know, it was one of those things that they developed a couple of their own heavyweights, and then pretty much every signing they made was a guy built somewhere else. Yep. It, it really hasn't – they haven't had much interest in building up guys. Like, you know, Stipe Miocic, yeah, they brought him along in 2011, but Travis Brown, that was 2010. Like, that's how long those two guys even have been in the UFC. Yeah. It's – it it doesn't happen that – it's just kind of a – it's weird that to see that now this year, we've got like 10 new heavyweights. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of – really freaky it's gonna, so, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a, a culture shock or it has been for a lot of mma fans watching 
watching these young heavyweight fighters get in there because it's it's ugly. Well, the, the interesting thing to me is that it's going to be very difficult for them to actually build these guys from as raw as some of, they, some of them are to actual elite talent because heavyweight is such a hard division to produce consistent results in. Yeah. Like, it takes such a special fighter to beat other elite athletes in that division consistently over and over again that a lot of guys, even elite athletes they pick up, they're going to suffer a lot of early setbacks and they're going to have to, I hope, hopefully the UFC can try and make themselves actually stick it out on a few of these guys because they're going to lose. Speaking yeah. of which they're the first two people I want to talk about, cause I want to dive in. We've got a lot of people to talk about this week. Francis and Ganu, Curtis blades. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is a, this is a weird matchup. It was supposed to be in Ganu versus, uh, Bojan Mihajlovic, um, who, who I'm, I'm actually like, I, I feel, I don't know. Mihajlovic didn't belong in the UFC. I don't know why he got removed from this card. Could be a suspension of some sort. Could be an injury of some sort. Has never been made clear. But it was a great setup fight for Nganu. It was a hey. Nganu, go out, fight this other striker who's way athletic, less athletic and way smaller than you, and just get a showcase win, build yourself up, look good, and now he's fighting Curtis Blades. Yeah, who is a decently accomplished wrestler and raw as hell when it comes to striking in MMA. Um, but both these guys are pretty good size for heavyweight, and both of them are long. Yep. Um, that that's one of the things that struck me, and and Ninganu uses it better on the feet. Ninganu like has a sneaky, he has a sneaky amount of reach where you see yep. guys hanging out at distance and they think they're safe, and then he'll uncork on like a really, he'll really turn his shoulders over on a cross, and then he'll hit his opponent, and you'll just see this look of shock that he actually reached them. Whereas like blades on the ground is. Like I said, really raw when it comes to striking and just like does like the huge hammer fist and mm-hmm. you're just struck by how much arm there is. Like when the arm when the hand comes whipping around, generates a lot of force. And but both has- of these guys to me, it feels like the UFC went out and picked, like they're lucky enough that they went out and got like a couple of NFL defensive ends in their prime. You yeah. Know? Yeah. These these guys, um, the one thing Ninganu, I, I I think he's both of them are in need of developing. Let's yeah. let's be clear there. Um, Ninganu, I think for the most part, my big issue with him is he's really defensively sound when it comes to, like the grappling because that's not his strong suit. The problem is he's not really good at escaping and forcing his game on other guys. He yeah. like hangs out and waits for the ref to break up clinches or break up groundwork. Um, other than that, he's got good power and good cardio and great size and it seems to be a pretty detailed outfighter um i like ninganu a lot but blades is just like and i think you phrased this when we were talking about it the um he's kind of like a brock lesnar fire in that yep. like he's just all raw physicality and aggression and he brings some unique ground and pound to the table <laughs> let's say well it, it's a thing like He's a huge, powerful power wrestler. And, I mean, it's the same kind of thing we had with Lesnar, where, like, you actually go and look at Lesnar's career. You look back over it. And there aren't a lot of, like, super quick KOs on Lesnar's record. He didn't just, like, walk out there, hit a dude, they'd fall down, and he was like, yes, I'm the champ, you know? It was more like everything he did to you hurt a shit ton. And... At some point, you had to stop. Like, you had to just quit. You mm-hmm. had to go away and try and get out of this fight because it was too overwhelming and it hurt too much. And that's the kind of thing that Blades has, too, where it's like, it's not all going to be pretty to start. I think he's already further along with his striking. I've, I've seen some striking, some of his striking with a, a bit later in some other fights, and it's, it's wooden... But it's also the kind of thing where he'll like throw out an ugly, like an ugly straight punch, and he'll knock an opponent on their ass because he just is so big and hits so hard. But it's gonna be, you know, it, it's he's not the kind of fighter that's just gonna like take somebody down, hit them five times, and they're gonna be knocked out. 
like Derek Lewis. Derek Lewis is a any one time he hits you, he could just crumple you kind of fight. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like that. It's more just like he's going to get on top of you and start chipping away at you. And he's so big and so powerful that you can't take it for more than a round and a half. You and it's an, he keeps when, – when he senses blood, it's like an overwhelming pace. He, yeah. goes, he goes absolutely nuts. And I'm just hoping that we get, we get to see the double hand <laughs> smash in the UFC because that was the fight ending streak of his RFA bout. Yeah, he he's got some he, he's definitely got some funk going on in his game and I like I said it's just one of those fights where fans are going to have to get used to and the UFC's going to have to get used to the idea like do not let either of these two guys go. You will not get many heavyweight athletes like either of these two. Yeah. Stay with them. Give them like 5 years and just say, "Okay, you know what? We're going to keep sending them out there." How long did how it's one of those things like to use someone on this card to as an example, uh, how long did it take Ben Rothwell to turn into the fighter that he is now? It took him an amazing... This is a dude that started fighting as a pro when he was 17 and is now 34. Like, like, or not as a pro. I think he started maybe as an amateur when he was 17, but is now 34. And he started as a pro not long after. He started as a pro in 2001. That's 15 yeah, like years January ago. of 2001. Like, yeah. Like, took his first amateur fight in 1999. This dude's been fighting as long yep. as Anderson Silva. And he's yeah. just starting to get good at heavyweight. Yeah, it's he's total. now become, like, a... It, everything's clicked, and he's an elite heavyweight now. And so, you you know, the UFC, when they sign a guy like Ngannou or Blades, who are a year or two into their pro careers each, he got to be thinking, like, okay, we need to give these guys multiple years to get yeah. this. Yep, fucking heavyweight man. I know. It's a totally, it's a to, it's 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 an utterly different game. Like it's a totally different sport. It is. It really, absolutely is. It, heavyweight MMA is not. Uh, it's not really MMA. It's just its own, like its own thing. It's just it's heavyweight MMA. That does bring up Derek Lewis. Surprisingly, is still something of a prospect on this card, and he's still developing a lot like we've still seen fight to fight improvement for him over his whole career he's still in the first decade of his career like he's a baby right. he is i'm i'm really excited to see what he can do to gabriel gonzaga here well i'm less excited to see what happens to gabriel gonzaga <laughs> honestly but yeah i i like gabriel gonzaga like i do too i have watched him a long time seems like a solid dude Makes the occasional funny video online. Clearly yep. has a sense of humor. I don't want to watch him get melted. Yeah. L Lewis, like, he he's finally, you know, the thing that he's really learned lately that makes me really excited about this fight is that he's found patience. And so now when guys are coming after him and trying to wrestle him and stuff like that, he's not just, like, trying to throw ugly strikes while they try to take him down. He's actually stuffing shots, pushing guys off, creating space, and then landing huge bombs to end mm -hmm. the fight. And that kind of spells – like, you saw how much Gonzaga froze up when he fought uh, Constantina Rockin last time. Like, it, it, I feel like if he gives uh, – if he gives Lewis that kind of time and space, it's going to be a whole different thing. Lewis yeah, does not like, have that much, that same kind of I'm going to check and hang back and only counter that Iraqin has. Yeah, I think the one thing I'd say about Lewis, though, is that counter wrestling is still something of an issue for him, though. Like, yeah. still gets taken down, and Gabriel Gonzaga could maybe finish something if they hit the ground. It, it's not un, it's it's not unheard of that Gonzaga would beat Lewis. It, yeah. just, it doesn't it's, seem that likely. No, I think the I think that I think the smart money is all on Lewis knocking out Gonzaga. But I could see a I could see one of those losses that just makes you goes like ah oh, man like that's all right. It's he's still, he's still in his first ten years, folks. He's doing yeah, his yeah, too. I know. So and now we've got another heavyweight prospect fight of sorts coming up. Um, between Timothy Johnson and Marcin Tybura on this card. 
this is the, this is the lesser of the two heavyweight prospect fights, in my opinion. But yeah, well, it's it's weird because it's Inganu and Blades are the guys who have like all of the obvious physical tools you could ever want in the world. Yeah, and are still learning the MMA game. And Johnson and Tybura are guys who are like getting by on being kind of crafty or super tough or all these other sort of ancillary skills and maybe don't have all the physical tools in the world. Mm-hmm. Although Johnson, to his credit, is a lot more of kind of a big dump truck than I would have given him credit for when he first stepped in the cage. I remember his fight with Shmuel Abdurakhimov and suddenly I was like, wait, he's kind of huge. Yeah. Kind of an ogre. So I, I'll be interested to see this Tybura fight because this is, I think, the really good test of both guys. Tybura is somebody that really does, has cut his teeth regionally by being the toughest dude in any fight he's in. Yeah. Like, you cannot knock Marcin Tybura out. You can't outlast him. At some point, he's just going to drag you to the ground, and then once he's there, he'll find a way to work you over with uh, strikes or to work you over for a submission, do something. Mostly submission, but... yeah. Either way, like he will out tough you and outlast you. And Timothy Johnson is I kind of think of him as like this new prototype of like this is the average heavyweight the UFC wants. This mm-hmm. big huge dude who's tough everywhere. And you may not be the most technical dude in the world, but can a guy like Tybura go out and beat him just off toughness and ground skill? Yeah, it, it should be interesting. I think I think Tebura might have some issues in this just size wise. Um and I I like Tebura, but I'm not I, I see him as a ha- a decent prospect, but like I, I'm not that jazzed for him yet. And you know, he's only what, like legitimately, like not even joking, heavyweight. He's young in his career at this point. He's like only Five years in, four years in, something like that. 2011, so just coming up on five years in this year. And and realistically, heavyweight has a longer learning curve, so I'm willing to forgive him some losses, but I just wonder if at some point 205 is maybe, I don't know, 205 is within reach. He he comes in with a lot of extra padding, and we're talking about a guy like is the fight he had before um, the win that got him into the UFC. Stephen Poitz. Yeah, yeah, he dropped about to a, a, a decent light heavyweight prospect. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. I am I like him, but I see him mostly as, as you said, he's a really tough as shit wrestler um, who's aggressive on the mat, but not really much of a striker. Yeah. And and we talked about it. If you're coming in primarily as a wrestler, that's a skill set that like a lot of MMA fighters are equipped to deal with. Now, and heavyweight's heavyweight's different. different. Heavyweight, heavyweight's different as we keep saying, but I think, I think Timothy Johnson, Timothy Johnson to me is just like, he is the lesser version and a slightly more entertaining version of Jared Rochal. Like he kind of wants to pressure forward, push you into the cage and grind you down. And I don't see why he doesn't do that to Tybura. Yeah. It's tough. I, I, you know, I need to analyze it more to pick winners and losers because that's obviously not really what we're doing here. Yeah. But, It's definitely, I mean, that, that Putz fight does give me pause for Tybura because Putz is another, he, he is the prototype, like I said, when I talk about Johnson being the prototype for the UFC, uh, Putz is that kind of guy too, where he's big and he's tough and he's in good shape and he's otherwise not all that technically mar- you know, great a fighter. Like, mm-hmm. watching him fight, he just kind of throws everything together at any time and mostly gets by on being the better conditioned athlete and uh, just out toughing and out grinding opponents. And for him to beat Tybura, that is, you know, even though it was a doctor stoppage, he was legitimately beating Tybura in that fight. And that's, that's a, that gives me pause to see Tybura because it's like, well, if he's going to face a whole bunch of guys like that in the UFC, you know, how, how often is he going to win? This is a rough, rough fucking welcome to the UFC for Tybura. Like, Johnson gonna, is just a terrible match for him. It, it's going to be that way for every heavyweight, though. That's why I keep talking about, like, all these guys are going to need a ton of time because... Why, when you, you, why not keep Renan Potts around? Just feed him... Just just make him the dude to feed the first-time first timers. 
Yeah, I mean, they're going to have to figure out some stuff like that because all, all they're picking up all these great young heavyweights, but that just means that the division is packed full of young guys who can all beat each other. Mm-hmm. So we'll see who comes out of that. Blade, you know, Blades probably has the easiest, the most potential to tr- just blaze a path to being elite because he's such a power wrestler. Yeah, but um, I would agree with that. I think I think uh, I think um, Francis Nagato has a chance to really develop into like a nice veteran striker of the division. Oh sure. Like I think I think he's, I think he's that- got huge potential. I mean, I think he's got title potential if you look like five years out, six years out. If he like the next step for him is learning how to get out of, get off the cage, get up like more effectively. Cause he already gets up kind of effectively, but like he can get stuck. If if he's in the half guard and he gets an overhook, he's good to go. But if you like sit in his full guard, he doesn't know what to do. Yeah. He has to learn that. He he has to learn some more of that JDS game when JDS was fighting prime. He, you know, oh, Jesus, just a sec, talk. <laughs> All right, so, no, I agree with you there that the idea that he would need to really work on his hips and just make his hips a lot more active. Um, because Nagato, the biggest issue with him when I was watching him is just the passivity on the ground. Just he, he's very, very safe, which is good because he's not getting finished. But at some point, you're just going to give away rounds when you do that. Uh, but... I would. I don't know if I see title potential in his future, um, but it's heavyweight, and fucking Mark Hunt got a shot at the title, so who knows? But I definitely see him. I see. I see Nagato, like I said, down the road, becoming that like really veteran striker that I feel like most other divisions have now. And and like heavyweight doesn't. Uh, Overeem is Overeem. Yeah, kind of Overeem. Yeah, like the the veteran striker of the division that like even even like that has a solid grappling base. Like obviously he's the champion right now in welterweight, but Robbie Lawler, kind of like that that veterany like. Well, Carlos striker. Condit would be. Yeah, Condit too. So like I, I, that's kind of where I see him coming down the road. Yeah, I mean it's I don't know. It's just it, it he he's such a freak athlete that I'm kind of. I'm higher. I, I'm I'm really high on him. But anyway, he could outlast like all yeah. the fighters and end up being the best one of the guys left. Yeah. Um. So let's let's see. That that's all this heavyweight action up at the top. We got another heavyweight bout down lower down, but quite a lot less exciting. Otherwise, probably. I don't know. After that, the new person to talk about the most becomes a little trickier. Yeah, well, and we're still just talking prospects. I mean, Dolby yeah. is the guy. I Dolby uh, is Dolby even still a prospect? I guess he is. Yeah, yeah I mean, like I don't. I know. He's on the edge. He's coming up on that six year mark, but you know, it's still where he's at, at at the division. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay talking about a guy like that when he's still like in that gray zone. Yeah, I I, I like Dolby definitely. He's still. I I still think that like. My thoughts on him when he came in were that he's the kind of guy that could immediately be like borderline top twenty, but probably stays right there. Mm-hmm. That's still kind of how I feel about him. I, I think I think a lot of your and mine reservations about him when we were scouting welterweights kind of came out in the Darren Till fight, mm-hmm. um, where you know because we and, and since Pat's not here to defend himself. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, we went, the former co-host of the show, Patrick Wyman used to give us a whole lot of crap for not putting him on our list. And um, I think the till fight, he looked a little slow at times. He was definitely, I mean, he got trapped on the outside and a lot of the wrestling problems that we kind of honed in on resurfaced again after looking improved at times. And given Dolby, his cardio has always been good. He always come, he uh, never stops fighting, and he rallied hard in that third round to pull out a yeah. draw. But I agree with you that it, I see him being more of like a, a, you know, just on that ranked level, like maybe get gets ranked at some point, more Even of like then, a hard, hard yeah. test for guys. But doesn't mean he's not a good fighter. Doesn't mean I don't no. want to see him. He's a fun fighter to watch. Puts a really good volume on dudes. Puts a uh, like really excellent adapted style for uh, UFC. 
So I mean, Till Till is what a real top. I, I and I passed on Till. I'm not, I was not big on Till when he got signed. I thought that he was an overblown can crusher. But to be fair, Till is a lot more what an elite top top shelf prospect looks like. In that, had he had more tools and more experience, he would have beat Dolby because he was faster and more powerful, and just a more dynamic athlete than Dolby. He was landing crushing strikes early in that fight. And it was just that eventually he kept going to the exact same ones over and over and over again. And Dolby's a veteran enough fighter to figure out how to work around it and to outwork him and Till got hurt. Yeah, I think Till Till to a certain degree in terms of our scouting him, uh suffered from the competition he was fighting. I mean the Ashita fight team is notable for avoiding actual fighting they're not quite like they're not they're not um like explode level of can crushing no. they at least go out and find legitimate cans that are like real fighters that just aren't that good at fighting um it's it's but, a part it's a product but, of the fact that they fight out of south brazil where there's just not a lot of developed talent yeah in that part of the country too but to a certain extent, like then that makes it, to a certain extent, like you said, it, a lot of what he does can be chalked up to the fact like, well, he looks okay, but you know the guys he's fighting look like such trash that I don't feel like I can make a, a informed choice on that. So the first time we like now that we've seen him in there with two pretty quality opponents, he looks like the real deal. Yeah, no, I'm much more much higher on Till at this point, and think of him as a real future potential ranked fighter in the welterweight division. When's he getting back in the cage? Like, I don't know. Yeah, he has no fight scheduled right now, but just like, no, I, I can't remember if he got an injury or anything like that. I don't know that he did, but I yeah, I don't know when he'll be back. Um, otherwise, on this card, I'm also really I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what Damir Hadzovic can do. I got to say, the Bosnian bomber, I'm not quite as high on him as some other people who were big Cage Warriors fans uh, think that, you know, he. they were like, oh, this kid's just, like, streaking to the top. I'm not so sure on that, but I really do think he's a quality, like, you know, he's, he's got a developing technical quality power punching game. And I'm interested to see where that carries him. I agree. I think he's 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 a well MMA adapted striker. Yeah. Um, who is just good enough in the clinch, just good enough wrestling and grappling to to make his game work. Um, and man, does he have a tough fight? Yeah. It's a like, terrible first fight. He's fighting Maribek Tysimov. And I, I'm wondering if they're kind of thinking this is going to be more of a showcase for Tysimov. Like, I, well, you know what I think I, I can almost guarantee is what happened here. What I can almost guarantee happened is that Tysimov said, I want to fight on this European card. Get me on this card. And he said that maybe a month or two, you know, maybe two months out from the fight. And they're like, well, who do we have that's unbooked and has a visa already? And they're like, eh, I don't think we really have anybody. So let's sign a guy and bring him on. We've been meaning to sign this guy. He looks good. And this will get Tyson off this fight he wants. That, that looks to be, considering that he was supposed to be, Tyson off was supposed to be on fight night 81. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had two, um, two fights canceled out from under him. Yep. Um, so I, I think it's just... And then, case. yeah, so that was probably... He just he needs to get in the cage. Like, I want to be on this. My visa's lined up. I can fight here. Get me somebody. Yep. And I, I think that that's what got Hadzovich the call, and that's why he's getting a tough-as-hell debut fight. So if you're a fan of Dem- D- Demir Hadzovich... Look you, away. You cover just your eyes. wait until after this fight to, to judge. Yeah. Um... Otherwise, on this card, it's opening with a couple of uh, prospects that I'm interested in who neither guy is a guy that I would necessarily peg as like, oh, you know, blue chip or anything like that. But they both have very interesting aspects to the game, especially Alessio de Ch- Chirico is a guy that like he looks like he has the athletic base tools. But coming off of the Italian MMA scene, his his game is just so like ramshackle. 
You yeah, know, built well, out of all these small parts that don't necessarily fit together at all. I, I will say that we, we we did scout him for our uh, list, and he missed the middleweight list, right? Yeah, he was on the middleweight list. I'm kind of sad to see him dropping down to welterweight because middleweight's so barren. But he just missed the middleweight top ten. It was um, like he was tied for eleven. Yeah, yeah, he was he was pretty close. I will say I went back and watched his most recent fight. And his game seems to be coming together better, and his wrestling is no longer the trash fire it was. It's clearly something he's been working on. Um, so nice to see skill development from him. And I actually think maybe getting out of middleweight is not the worst thing in the world because there's some quality fighters coming up in middleweight. Actually, like I, I you know, I'm putting together. A, um, uh, I'm scouting again for a top ten prospects in MMA list, and. I'm shocked at the number of middleweights I'm looking at. It's mm. one of the that, like, there's, there's like two or three middleweights that legitimately might make the list, and I'm kind of surprised at this. Yeah, I mean, the UFC just went out and they picked up. Uh, I expect them to be in the UFC long term. Khalil Roundtree and um, Phil Haas for the re- most recent tough season. I expect both of them for light heavyweight. I expect both of them to be at middleweight. So. There's definitely going to be some inju- injection of new young top middleweight talent out there, but welterweight is just such a killer division. Like yeah. climbing those ranks is so difficult. So I'll be interested to see what Tachirico there does I, there. Yeah, it, that that though, man, it, it is tough. That's a rough. It's a rough division. Both are tough. I, 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 I it is nice to see the possibility that more. Uh, more middleweights are going to start coming up because boy, does that division need it? Yeah, it really yeah. does. I, I'm not sure dropping down to welterweight's your answer there. No, but he, and he's fighting a skilled sort of like really generally well or like all round sort of B fighter in mm-hmm. Bojan Velaskovic here. Yeah, should make for an interesting fun debut. Velaskovic, like I say, it's just sort of. Does everything decently. Could be a fun fighter to watch as that develops just because he's the kind of fighter that will gladly take the fight anywhere at any time and is decent enough at everything to do it. But that's also probably a style that will limit him long term just because usually if you don't stand out exceptionally at something, somebody who does will beat you there. Yeah, I think Bojan's actually a sneaky, sneaky solid addition to the UFC. Yeah, um, yeah like you said, does everything well and is going to get some wins over people, possibly in ways that don't don't make him stand out, but definitely will get it, keep him around. And he'll, I, I expect him to be like a mainstay on European cards mm-hmm. for a little while, especially with the, if they come to continental Europe and not like England or Ireland. So with we got a cup. We got one guy who's been around for a little while now. Well, who's been around for two fights now, and I know you're excited to talk about Ian Entwistle. Yeah. Yeah, Ian's fun. I mean, like, I, I don't, I don't have any like great illusions about Ian Entwistle like becoming a title contender. But, um, and we talked about this off air beforehand. MMA needs more exciting leg lockers. Yes, many more. Like, we we kind of had a, a an era of them. It feels like that is now gone with Paul Harris being kicked to the curb, and Imanari declining, and um. Trying to think who was I feel like there's at least one more that I'm forgetting off the uh, top of my head. Oh, well there's Marcin Held. Marcin Held is, is kind of that uh, yeah, I'm, so I'm thinking of like the the old school, like really classic leg lock dudes. Uh, Shinya Aoki, Dean Lister. Yeah. I mean it, it, it kind of feels like a lot of the people that came up classically with a really leg lock heavy game went away and then there's like been this little break period where we're not like we've got held in Bellator. But we don't – in the UFC, we don't really have that game anymore. If I, if I can speak to that real quick, I think we're going to see it come back. Yeah. Mostly because um, MMA grappling tends – there tend to be trends in MMA grappling that seem to, like, they lag behind a little bit, like, the the grappling scene. Like, obviously, like, I did the big piece on guillotines, like, a little while ago, and that seemed to follow in the footsteps, like, the – it really started happening like the seeds got planted after the guillotine revolution in submission grappling when like you know marcelo garcia and the henzo gracie guys all started finishing uh guillotines all over the place um 
And right now, like the super hot thing in grappling is leg locks, like heel hooks uh-huh. and leg locks. It's like it, it's the big thing in the professional grappling scene. Everybody's trying to get their leg lock game on that next level. Everyone's trying to follow Eddie Cummings and Gary Tonin into the future. Um, and I would expect, and and it's not as widespread as like all that, obviously, but. There Wait, because it's illegal in a lot of circuits, isn't it? Um, it's getting it, it, it really. It's getting to the point where the IBJJF is like becoming the last holdout that really doesn't do leg locks. Um, mostly because the no gi scene is really coming up. But good, good. Yeah, without getting too much into that, I, I expect there's a large segment of the grappling community that is that is rediscovering a lot of new stuff about leg locks and kind of coming up with their own little details on them. And I kind of expect to see that to cross over to MMA soon. I would love that because the the thing about a leg lock guy, and especially a good one, is that they honestly can beat just about anybody on any night. Yeah. Like Paul Harris at his best, it was just like, well, what if you did put him into like a fight with GSP or something? He'd probably lose, but GSP would probably not knock him out and might want to spend a whole bunch of time on top of him and you know, like yeah. it, it, that, that's the crazy thing about leg lock dudes is that they they'll never they, they can never really be champs usually because the game isn't quite usually well-rounded enough or consistent enough to carry them against elite fighters over and over and over again. But on any one night in any one fight, they can always pull off an amazing win. Yeah, the, the thing uh, – well, okay, very common thing with leg lock guys, is, and I say this one is like, like sort of a pseudo leg lock guy myself, it's really easy to get tunnel vision and just keep like, no, the, the, the opening's there. I'm going to keep going for yeah. it. And you and you hear leg lock guys like, like, like Dean Lister or Eddie Cummings complain about how everyone's like, well, they say I'm just a leg lock guy, but I finish arm bars and rear naked jokes <laughs> all the time in the gym. It's like, yeah, but when you go to competition, you just – you just like tunnel vision on those feet. Um, yeah. And one of the things too, that makes it hard is that you almost need two leg locking games. If you're going to be an effective leg locker, you need one for when the guy tries to run. And then you need one for when the guy sits there and tries to counter attack. Um, and most people, when they learn to leg lock, initially people run from them. And then if you're in a gym with pretty good leg lockers, some of them will stay there and then suddenly you're like, ah, oh, I keep going for foot locks. I haven't tapped anyone in like a month, but I've been tapped by like 10 foot locks in the last week. Um, and I think that's part of it too, is that the, you kind of have to maintain these two different games and then you get really good. If you're in a leg lock gym, you get really good at like the counterattacking leg lock game. And then in MMA, a lot of guys just run, just straight up, no gi slip out of stuff and all that. And, uh, I think I think it's hard to maintain both those games at the same time. Yeah, no, it's it, it's a tough way to go. Like like I say, I mean, you kind of have to resign yourself to not being, to never being champ with that game, but to mm. always being like, you you can be a main card mainstay. You can all be on every main card because people are always going to want to see what happens in your fight. But you're never going to be like a championship contender if all you're doing in MMA is a like hyper aggressive leg lock game. Yeah, and I think Ent Whistle strikes like a nice medium. And I think I think leg locking just and me personally, just how I do it, I think it's nice as like a backup game if, for your submission game. Like have an A game and then have it be one of those things where people are like when they talk about you as a fighter, they're like, oh yeah, and by the way, he's got pretty good leg locks. So it's like they get so focused on stopping one thing and then every so often you bust you bust out a heel hook when the guys get lazy on them, you know, but yeah. I think Ed Whistle can strike that balance a little bit, just having watched them fight. But yeah, it's a tough thing to do. It is. So we got a few other guys on this card coming in new. Uh, I should say, actually, we, we skipped over it, but go, we should go up and talk about this Moro Stanchu fight up here on the main card, because both of these are quality prospects in the women's strawweight division. And this is probably just going to be an insane one round all out brawl. Yes. Yeah. I, I anticipate this one not going very long and being totally nuts uh, because uh, uh, Stansu is like Wanderlei Silva, insane levels of aggressiveness just mm-hmm. goes right at you and does not give a fuck about the second round. 
<laughs> fights over in the first. That's that's all she cares about. And um, she's had one fight go the distance, and it was a split decision. Uh, and she she throws it all she throws it all at her opponent um, in a very short period of time. So, and uh, Morose is a surprisingly good athlete. Um, a really good striker. Everyone focused in on the fact that she like had all these armbar wins, and it actually kind of disguised the fact that she's actually kind of a sneaky, trashy grappler. Um, yeah, she's really more of a striker, and she's fairly tall for the division, and she's long for the division, and she uses her length unusually well for like MMA in general, not just like women's MMA, but like across MMA, she actually makes use of her length very well. Yeah, the big the, the big question to me is if Stance you can blitz her, does Moros pull guard? And if she pulls guard, does Stance you get submitted? Guard is like the only place that I've seen Moros like throw up some arm bars that were half decent. Yep. Um but her grappling game is it's not actually that good. It got a lot of praise coming in because she had like or was it five out of six wins were by armbar coming yeah. up? But but Stancy's grappling game is not that good either. Yeah, like, she's Stancy the kind of fighter might... that is pathologically aggressive everywhere, and she'll dive straight into Morose's guard and just start throwing arms at her, like asking for one to be grabbed. Yeah, no, it was one of those that uh, Stancy falls into the category of the kind of girl that she could armbar. Um, it was just that when she ran into Valerie Letourneau, like a girl who trains with like some uh, American top team, with like a legitimate Brazilian jiu-jitsu school. She just like drove trucks through the holes in Morose's grappling. Oh yeah, no, yeah. and she was able to outpower Morose on the feet. That was the mm -hmm. other thing. Yeah, Morose does have very sharp striking, but she's not the most powerful puncher out there. No, no, so. she's much more of an accumulation sort of striker. It'll be interesting to see with Stansu, who's very much like bricks for hands, just chuck everything with every strike and see how much damage she can do in five minutes. So I I'm excited for this fight. Two women who, you know, already have shown that they can have a long future in the division. Are, well, Moroz has already shown that she can have a long future in the division. Stansu, I think she can. It'll be it'll be one of those things of like how temper how much can she temper her style for the UFC and still maintain the kind of imposing power presence that she has in her game. Can she be somebody who throws half as many strikes around and still wins rounds? Swinging bricks is an excellent description of Stancy striking yeah. in general. Just like and it's kind of how it looks at times. It looks like she's trying to club someone with a brick. It does. She actually has de the thing I like that really I think saves her in that is that when she actually thinks about it, her head movement's not too bad. Yeah, like she, she will actually do a good job slipping punches and getting herself offline and doing some of the little things that she needs to do. It's just that she'll also just chuck you know fists out of her pockets, kind of. Yeah, the the like the five to ten seconds before she goes eight shit, she has actually has pretty nice technique. Yeah, and then, it, and then and then as soon as she thinks she's hurt the person, it all goes out the window. It's true. Uh, we've got a couple other f fights on this card. Like I say, this is just super prospect heavy. Uh, Philip Payich is fighting Damian Stasiak. Payich being a newcomer. Lucas Martins is fighting. He's fighting Robert White Whiteford, and uh, Cyril Asker is fighting Jared Cannonier. I think Stasiak's probably the most interesting guy out of all that. Yeah, Stasiak's – he's one of the, like – he's a karateka who is pro, who's more of an MMA grappler than anything. Yeah, he, he's one of those things that when I, like, first searched him and looked him up, um, back when he was fighting, like, Grundy in Bama, it was one of those things, like, yeah, the first thing that comes up are his karate fights, and then you watch him fight in MMA, like, this guy's actually a pretty good grappler. This guy's got a really good sense of takedown and control and submission and – Submitted Grundy, which is like pretty dang good because Grundy's a what like former rest, uh, former national wrestling team who has basically just dedicated himself to building a submission grappling game. Yeah, he's, so. Gr Grundy's a good wrestling grappler. I think the the thing that gives me real pause with Stasiak, of course, is that he then lost his debut to Yao Tin Meza. 
and he lost it largely because he got outworked on the ground. And yes, that that's a problem. Yeah, Stasiak, like was one of those dudes that I I I feel like you know Grundy is a young fighter who was primed to be caught by something because he's a top game wrestler with the front headlock game and just young fighters get caught. Yeah. But in the UFC against other good grapplers, Stasiak's not an overwhelming athlete. And so no. I feel like he's just going to get locked down and outworked by the general class of UFC grappler. I, I would agree with that. I mean, it's just, I don't think you know, Paige is necessarily that guy. No, but. no, I think Paige is going to get. I, I watched Paige and, and he seems like a decent athlete, but just doesn't really have much of a cohesive MMA game at this point. He kind of floats on the outside and throws like single strikes. He's he's a good athlete and a good inside boxer. Like when he's in the pocket, he actually throws combinations pretty well, but he has no way of getting there or maintaining it when he is there. So you'll see like these five second flashes where he'll throw like three strikes, like, oh shit, that there it is, there it is. And then he'll either immediately get clinched or end up back on the outside spending five minutes looking for like one shot to throw. Yeah. Oh. That's that's a problem. Yeah. No. Well, other than that, I mean, this is this should be a fun card. I think this is going to be a whole bunch of young fighters, and uh, the number of heavyweights on this either mean it's going to be it's, it's most likely going to be awful fun and hysterical all at the same time. Oh, I, I'm really looking forward to a Sunday morning MMA card with heavyweights. Like that to <laughs> me sounds so much fun. Honestly, uh, no lie. So I take a quick put look now. Now we've talked our way through most of this card, and there's a ton on it. Um, I want to take a quick look outside at the regionals this week because there are a ton of prospects out there fighting, some real top guys, a lot of guys we've scouted before fighting this week. Um, most namely, over in PXC, Sebastian Catastam is making a return from a loss last year, a split decision loss. He's coming back to defend his welterweight title. He was fighting in Europe when he lost. Um, he's a great power striker. I'm really interested to see what he can do. That loss is probably a huge setback because I kind of think that he was on the verge of making a jump from PXC to the UFC. But Yeah, if I remember, he's a pretty quality athlete. And- yeah. Great athlete, yeah. good power striker, and it's a rough. It's a rough. A split decision is a rough way to go down on the yeah. regional scene. Also on that card, Kiyomi Matsushima. Uh, Matsushima is fighting, and he's a de- looks like a decent Japanese prospect, a lightweight, surprisingly, and a pretty big one. Um, he's only twenty three. He's a good athlete. He's hyper aggressive. The rest of his game isn't really there, but. He lost, he won his last fight by slam KO. So, you know, definitely has the baseline athletic tools and the power to be a, a to develop further and be a more interesting fighter and guys have made the jump from PXC to the like PXC is a decent platform for getting to the UFC. It's not like he's fighting off in deep or Pancrase or something like that where it really seems like it's hard for guys to get out of there. So, he's somebody to watch out for definitely. M1's got a big show this week too. Uh, Alexei Kunich- er, Kunchenko, middle or welterweight fighter, looks. Uh, he's not young. He's 31, I believe, but his MMA career is pretty young. Super good athlete, very sharp Muay Thai striker, really clinical. Really like his game. He could be a really fun fighter in the future as he continues. Maxim Divnich is fighting another good striker, Ukrainian, decent athlete, somebody we scouted. And Sergio de Fatima, a Brazilian uh, welterweight that we scouted, who's very much in the Brazilian style, very wild, very powerful, very willing to kind of do what, whatever, wherever. Has hit. He hasn't quite hit a cold streak, but he's definitely kind of cooled off a little since when we first scouted him. But I, I'm interested to see what he can do over an M1 now. That's a weird place for him. Uh, a legacy FC card. Antonio Tricoli is in the main event, coming off a loss to Jacob Volkman. He's a good lockdown top position gra- grappler out of Brazil, only 25. I think Volkman was probably the 
absolutely wrong fight for a guy who's a lockdown top control grappler to get when he's young. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's this Akmat card. This is a huge Akmat card. It's full of like every every UFC vet that you haven't seen fight for the past two years is on this Akmat card. Got the- I love that we get excited about like Akmat cards. It's got pa- Paulo Tiago and Tiago Silva. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Bellator light heavyweight Volkan Ozdemir, uh, Canadian heavyweight Tanner Bozer. Ah. It's just like it's all of these, like every kind of quality regional dude that isn't already signed somewhere else is fighting on this ACMAC card, which is all Grand Prix tournaments for like every weight division on one card. Jeez. And on that, in that too are a couple of really top prospects, great looking prospects. Light heavyweight, um, Magomed Ankalaev, guy we looked at for our scouting report, he came in at number five as a light heavyweight, 23 year old Dagestani uh, low output technical striker, but has actually like he looked improved in his last bout. I'm really interested. He's fighting Dan Spawn, who came who had a, a one fight UFC stint coming off tough. And Mubakar Bagaev, uh, welterweight, 22 year old, another powerful striker, great kicker, great athlete, also a little low output. But Vagaev and Ankalaev are top prospects on this Akmat card. Uh, over in, I think in Croatia, Moldovan fighter Vlad Popovsky is fighting. He's a guy that's been on a lot of uh, scouting lists over the past few years. He's only 24. He's a welterweight, but he's probably a lightweight in the UFC. Really powerful. I'm pretty sure he comes from a long combat Sambo background. So making some waves on that circuit. Then another guy I want to talk about really quick too, Brazilian flyweight uh, fighting on one of the smaller Brazilian cards this week. Flavio de Quiroz. Uh Looks like he has a really long Muay Thai background in Brazil and is a flyweight, great athlete and exactly that kind of like fast trigger, fast combination power punching like collection that you want to see out of a flyweight athlete. Mm-hmm. You know, the, that, that sort of John Dodson skill set, maybe not quite that elite an athlete, but the kind of thing that watching him, I'm, I'm really interested to see what he could do and see if he can win enough fights to make the jump. That'd be, I mean, I know the UFC's got a flyweight season of tough coming up. If they could get a guy like him on it, that'd be a great addition. Somebody I'm looking out for, interested in. And up on a Canadian card, Canadian welterweight Jonathan Munier is fighting Joe Merritt, former UFC fighter. I'm still very interested to see what Merritt can do. Looks like looked like a great athlete, really raw talent. Got to the UFC too early, lost his last fight out of the UFC. Munier is coming out of TriStar, really tall, big welterweight. Not maybe the best prospect. That should be an interesting fight. So there's a lot of other guys out there outside the UFC this week, and a ton of guys in the UFC this week. Should be a lot of guys, a lot of fun. Yep, I'm looking forward to it. It should be a fantastic weekend of MMA. Absolutely. So on that note, thanks everyone for tuning in. You can find me on Twitter at Zane Simon. You can find Tom on Twitter at TP underscore Grant. You can find both of us over at Bloody Elbow. Give this video a like. That's a thumbs up. Subscribe to MMANation.com. That's D-O-T-C-O-M over on YouTube. That helps us a ton. That's where you can get all the latest Bloody Elbow shows, interviews, uh, other analytical content, all that good stuff. We'll be coming at you next week. We've got the Teixeira or the Evans Teixeira card that was supposed to be supposed to be Nurmagomedov Ferguson. Mm. I know. God, that 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 hurt. We we might get uh, Nurm- Nurmagomedov versus Cerrone on. I don't even know if it'd be on this card or on a future card. I haven't quite followed that that closely, but man, the, I'm so the pain's deep. still too near. Yeah, it that that really sucks. So, still it should be an interesting card. We got we'll have plenty to talk about for that too. Thanks everyone for tuning in, and we will see you next time.